I'm super excited to be here. This may be one of my most favorite guests, Marie Forleo. I'm going to introduce you. I probably don't need to because these folks already know you, but um, you are building an incredible digital empire, 52 million people strong right now, all around the social positivity, which I love, of business. Oprah has called you the thought leader for the next generation. I saw a picture of you working with Tony Robbins, one of my favorites, and maybe my most favorite guy, who I follow a lot, Richard Branson. Yes. So you've worked with people all around the world. Yes. And now you're here with us, and we're super happy to have you. I'm so happy to be here with you. Thank you. So we were talking before this. Right, and we started talking, and, and we we're talking about how you originally became a coach yourself. Yeah, can you tell us again? For sure. I mean, you know, my first gig out of school was on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange on Wall Street, and I liked that because I'm a person who has a lot of energy, and you know, you can't actually sit down on the floor. There's no seats besides these little flip down ones. And uh, you know, when I was at that job, I was super grateful to have a job. I'm the first in my family to go to college, and uh, I knew that this was an incredible opportunity, but. I started having this little voice inside, and I don't know if you've ever experienced this, where this little voice was like, Marie, this isn't who you're meant to be. This isn't what you're meant to do. You're supposed to be doing something else. Okay. Now, that little voice didn't tell me what else I was supposed to be doing, just that that particular job wasn't it. Mm. And I remember trying to like push away that voice. I was like, no, I'm going to be, you know, responsible adult. And and yes, exactly. But eventually that voice got so loud. And one day I was actually on the floor and uh, I started having what I now recognize as maybe like a mini panic attack. Like I couldn't breathe and I was nauseated and dizzy. And I told my boss, hey, I need to run out and go grab a coffee. Uh, But I had graduated the valedictorian of Seton Hall University, which is a Catholic school. So I had been trained for the past couple of years that in a crisis, you just look up just for a little direction, right? Right. So I ran to the nearest church, Trinity Church, and I sat on those church steps, Jim, and I bawled my eyes out because I felt like such a loser. And the first sign I got was to call my dad. Okay. uh, Because he was one that worked his buns off to put me through school. Right. And I was feeling terrible, like I was going to bring the shame on my family. To you know, How do you quit a job? I'm not a trust fund kid. We don't have a lot right, of money. Right. And my dad interrupted me. He's like, Frey, stop. He's like, you're going to be fine. He worked since you were nine. He's like, I'm not worried about you putting food on the table, but look, here's the secret to life. You have got to find something you love. And if this job is making you physically sick, you have to quit and go figure out what you're supposed to do because work in 40, 50 years, like that's the secret to having a great life. Amazing is to find advice. Something, right? So in that moment, it was the permission slip I needed. My dad didn't give me any other direction than that, just to go find something you love. So my first clues were that I was very creative and I also loved business. But again, our educational system doesn't do a good job, mm. I don't think, of preparing young people to figure out what the hell we want to be when we grow up. So... I thought, what about magazine publishing, right? There's the commerce side, there's the editorial side. This sounds right. So I went to temp agency and I got a job at Gourmet Magazine. Now I'm a woman who loves to eat, so this was awesome. My desk was next to the test kitchen and the food editors would bring me snacks all day. I'm like, this is amazing. Were you selling ad pages? I was helping, so I was a lowly assistant, but my boss was an ad exec, and so I was helping her sell those ad pages. Okay. So I'm doing good for a while, And then those same voices came back. And I'm like, not again. Marie, this isn't what you're meant to do. This isn't who you're supposed to be. This isn't what you're supposed to do in the world. And I'm starting to panic. And I'm like, what is wrong with me? I love work. So I took a step back and I thought, okay, Wall Street, very numbers focused. Ad sales, very numbers focused. Maybe I've been starving my creativity. Maybe I just picked the wrong side of the publishing business. So I went to the HR department. I said, hey, if there's any assistant job available on the editorial side, I'm up for it. Okay. So eventually got that call. I got an assistant position at Mademoiselle Magazine. Editorial side, fashion department. I'm like, okay. You've made it. Got to be it, right? It's going to be like creative, working with photographers, doing designs and layouts. So much fun. Fashion shows, blah, blah, blah. First couple of months, it was awesome. But then, of course, you know what happens. Those voices came back again. And I was like, oh my goodness. Seriously, I was like, what's wrong with me? Do I have some kind of cognitive disorder? Do I have commitment (laughs) issues, right? I'm like, I love working. I want to work and make a difference somewhere, but I can't stand all of these jobs. And it's not like I can quit because Mm -hmm. I have to provide for myself. So one day I was on the internet. This is 1999. Was it on Wait, the did internet? we have the internet in 1990? We did. It was you're, new. It you're was an early adapter. Super new. Yeah. And I was on the internet, and uh, I stumbled across 
an article about a new profession at the time called coaching. No one had ever heard of it, right? So I read this article, and I swear to you, Jim, it was like the clouds parted and little angel cherubs showed up with their <laughs> trumpets and, you know, sunbeams shot out of their eyes into my hearts, and it was like, oh! Like yeah, that. Exactly. I had this feeling about this thing called coaching and I couldn't explain it. Now I'm from New Jersey, so I'm a little, you know, I got a little sauce to me. The logical part of my brain said, this is the stupidest thing ever. You're 23 years old. You can't hold down a job. You're deep in debt. Who the hell is going to hire a 23-year-old? You haven't even lived life yet. Right. This sounds nuts. What One more thing you're going to you fail out. Absolutely. Who's going to listen to you? Blah, 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 blah. But I couldn't deny that on a cellular level, on my soul level, in my heart, this felt so right. So I signed up for a three-year coach training program on the spot. It was all done virtually, like teleconference back in those days. Yep. And I did my coach training at night while I worked at Mademoiselle during the day. So fast forward a couple months, I'm starting to like work with practice coaching clients, meaning my friends, their dogs, like anyone who would, who would let me work with them. And then I get a call from the HR department and the company had a promotion for me at Vogue. It was more money, it was more prestige, it was the best fashion magazine in the world. Yes. And so that was my decision point. Do I stay on this corporate path, keep the steady paycheck, the health benefits, do a job that everyone understands and respects and go on this path? Or do I quit and start this weird ass life coaching business? <laughs> no one knows what it means. I don't even know what it means. I just know what I is love a, it. What is a coach? How What's do a you, life coach? Uh, totally, yes. how do you do this? Yes. So of course I quit and uh, decided to go the coaching route. And the first thing that I did was I started bartending and waiting tables, which is how I helped put myself through college so that I could figure out not only how to be a great coach, which is the craft side, right? But also, how do you actually start and run a business, especially in this brand new digital era at that time? Mm -hmm. Getting a website, I started creating content, an email newsletter, how do you get clients? Like all of the things that we who consider ourselves coaches or helpers in any sense have to do. So that's how I got into it, and that was over 20 years ago. That's amazing. I had, I almost, I was like dying to interrupt you. Oh, because it, bring you it. Know, There's a reason why I'm such a big fan of yours. I did did the same thing, graduated, got a job on the stock exchange. It was terrible. And then <laughs> it was ter for me, it was terrible. Then I went into ad sales. Not terrible. Good. Not yeah. good. Yeah. So it's like really, it's this, how do you get the confidence to make the decision to do what your soul's purpose is telling you to do? Yeah. So how do you get that confidence to then actually take that next step? So for me, it was less about confidence and more about I had hit the wall so many times and there was so much pain in terms yeah. of trying these particular jobs and essentially failing and quitting right. that I just couldn't do. It was like a pattern, right? And mm -hmm. the, the, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing the same over thing. and expecting a different result. I was like, yeah. so I need to change something here. And the whole thing about coaching, it just felt right in my bones. So it was this combination of massive pain, can't take it anymore, and seeing an opening to something that actually felt right. But I had so much insecurity and so much self-doubt. So it wasn't like I quit to start my business and I'm like, I know what the hell I'm, right. I knew nothing. I was terrified. Right. I was so scared and I was terribly insecure about my age. So I actually um, got headshots done that made me look about 15 years older than what I was at the time and created this website. And I didn't lie, but no one ever asked me my age. So I just pretended I was older than I was. And that was like, I borrowed a little bit of confidence from older Marie right. to be able to just start communicating with people and to start working with people and to start creating content where I was focused on creating value for others. Because mm -hmm. anytime I had that spotlight in myself, man, I was a hot mess. Right. Hot mess. Yeah. It, you talk a lot about to taking the next step, just yeah. doing the work to get you there. Everything is figure outable, right? right? Every that's, every, that's a mantra I live my life by, and I don't want to interrupt you, but it's like this core belief that I have in my bones that served me ever since I was a kid was this notion that everything is figure outable, including starting your own business, finding that first client, figuring out how to get a website up or whatever it is mm -hmm. that's in front of you. So what I love about what you do as well, and Everything is Figure Outable is your new New York Times bestselling book. Yes. That I read and loved. Thank um, you. So but there is the other side of you that is, 
I like to call it like a mindful, a mindful entrepreneur. Yeah. And, and with health coaches, especially the ones that graduated from IIN, yes. what we teach them primarily is um, called the primary foods. And it is how to have a connection to a higher power, your spiritual connection, uh, and how to lead life with love. Yes. So it's kind of how do you reconcile, okay, I've just been taught to lead life with love. Mm-hmm. Basically, I'm, my new business is in love and a higher power. And now I actually have to go and ask people for money and make business planning and marketing. Yeah. Well, and that seems like such a, a divide. How do you overcome that divide? Well, first of all, if you believe in a higher power, whatever you may call that, everyone has all kinds of different names, you also have to believe that higher power made such things called business and money, right? So it is just a different expression of that. So I like to say, you know, God, again, good orderly direction. You can use anything that that feels comfortable for you, you know, is in the profound and the profane, but it's also in really successful businesses and Mm -hmm. really successful people. And there's an energy exchange, you know, for me, Here's one of the things that I discovered early on in my journey. You know, I would go to these business conferences because, again, there is the craft of doing what you do, just like health coaching and helping people understand how to really focus on the right nutrition, how to take care of their minds and their bodies and their souls to have those amazing health outcomes that we all want. But then there's the other side of it is how do you run a health coaching business Mm -hmm. so that it's sustainable, meaning that you can provide for yourself and your family, that you can grow the business of the brand so that you can reach more people and change more lives. You know, for me, it was about not only being a great coach, but also understanding the business. So here's what I want to get to. I went to all these different business conferences because, again, no one teaches us, generally speaking, how to be an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. It's a whole new world. Didn't have that education. Had to get it. And I noticed that at that time, most of the conferences I went to, and I love men, but 99% of the folks on the stages were men, and they weren't the most conscious or evolved of men. We'll just say that, (laughs) right? They were talking about customers as nothing more than numbers on the bottom of your balance sheet. And it's like, how do we extract as much profit as possible? And I was like, (laughs) oh, like I needed to take a shower. It sounded horrible. You know, I grew up in a home. My dad was a small business owner, and I would go in on nights and weekends to help him get done projects and do things to take care of customers. So my experience, is business is a place that you express love. How do you take care of people to such a level, give them an outstanding customer experience, deliver more value than you're ever asking for in terms of what your costs or you know right. the, the things are? And right. so there was this disconnect that I saw between what the established world of small business was and what I knew it could be. And here was the other thing. I started hearing from different people about their ideas to start their own business. And oftentimes it was like, you know, I have this product or this service I really believe in. I think it could help people, but I don't want to do the sales and marketing. I need someone else to do that. I'm the idea person or I'm the creative creative person, person, right? Like I need to find the right partner. And I will tell you, Jim, I wanted to shake the crap out of them. I'm like, no, for the love of all things holy, marketing and sales is the lifeblood of a great business. But here's what's true. So many people have a negative association with marketing and sales for good reason, Mm -hmm. because they're thinking about the marketing and sales of yesteryear, like the used car salesman. Right. Somebody who's slimy, chomping on the cigar, saying, hey, baby, you know what I mean? I got yeah. another deal for you over here. But modern marketing, which is a whole different animal, here's the difference. When you're practicing modern marketing, which is what we teach in B-School, which is what I hope every health coach learns and practices, however they, they get that education, the best of your humanity comes out not the worst. So reconciling, you were asking, how do I reconcile this business that's based in love with marketing and business? Recognize that when you really understand how to be a practitioner of modern marketing, you're practicing empathy, Mm -hmm. compassion, Mm -hmm. generosity, creativity. All of the best of you gets to come to center stage in service of that transformation that you want to help someone else create. So there's no disconnect, really. It's a myth. Is, is really the answer to my question. So the answer is, it's a myth. There's no disconnect. If there doesn't have to be. If you're in service, which I really got from what you said at the end, um, one, I heard deliver extreme value. Yes. And two, I really heard be in service. Yes. So here's what's so cool about the 
place we're in right now in terms of digital society. So again, when I started my business, social media did not exist, right? Email right. was super brand new. Um, we didn't have the ability to do podcasts or videos quite yet, not the way that we can do now. Yeah. So here's what's great about where we are. You have the ability to deliver so much value to people for free. And if you do it the right way, artfully, strategically, with a deep understanding of who your ideal customer is and who it isn't, the value you have to offer to the world, you can make a difference to so many people who may or may not ever say yes to your services. Right. And the people who can afford to work with you and who want to work with you are automatically engaged and want to say yes. Mm -hmm. So does that make sense? Yeah, it sure does. It's like, you know, a lot of people often say, well, I feel bad. This is like something that I should just be giving to the world. And it's like everyone has a right to earn a good living. It's part of it. Yes. You know, the healthier you are financially, the healthier you can make other people. Completely. It's, it's, it's putting on, you know, this is something that's been said a lot, but it's putting on your oxygen mask first. You have yeah. to make a living and be comfortable. If you're worrying about your rent and your bills, how are you possibly going to coach someone to better health? Absolutely. And I also think that that energy, you know, I remember this in my own journey. So uh, everyone has a different level of financial risk averseness, right? So that's something that I always encourage people to discover for themselves. Right. Some humans, they need to burn everything behind them because that, that type of pressure really supports them right. in rising up and creating results. Mm -hmm. There's other of us, and I raise my hand to this, where I'm more financially risk averse, right? I wanted to have, when I started my business, the bartending, the waiting tables, I taught dance and fitness classes, I cleaned people's toilets, because I wanted cash flow coming in so that I didn't have this desperate energy seeking, like seeping into my potential coaching clients or into my content that I was creating. Right. I didn't want that leaking out. And, you know, I've since done some research and there's actually some studies that prove that entrepreneurs that keep some form of day job are actually 33% less likely to fail. Wow. Because they kind of master their time. They also have a little bit of cash flow coming in, which again, for some of us, helps us be more creative and more bold as we're getting our businesses started. It sounds so cr When you don't feel desperate, yeah. you can you have a more sense of abundance because you have some safety, some security. Yep. Then you can focus more on your dreams. Yes. And I think there's a great... <sighs> It's something that most of us feel and that we don't always articulate, but it is detrimental, I think, to not only our business growth, but our happiness in life. And it's this feeling that we're behind, that we're not right. where we should be by now in terms of our life. And everyone has it. They have it in their 20s, their 30s, their yes. 40s, their 50s, their 60s, their 70s. I've worked with people on all age spectrums, you know what I mean? From teenagers all the way up to folks in their 70s and yeah. 80s. And everybody has it like, oh, I have to get ahead. And I think that if you can catch that and know, first of all, it's chronic and universal. But second of all, it's not true. Right. You can ease back a little bit and take your time and build a business that is really true to you. Again, there are some people who are those burn the bridges types and you got to quit your job and put it all on the line because that's how you rise. Most people who are like that know themselves to be like that, mm -hmm. but they go ahead and do it. Other people torture themselves and think you're not a real entrepreneur or you're going too slow if you actually take your time. And it's total BS. I agree. I agree. There's something to be said about being in the perfect place and the perfect time for you. Yeah. 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 Right? It took me seven years before I was confident enough emotionally and financially to go 100% in yeah. on the business that I have today. And I wouldn't trade one of those years for anything. I learned so much. There were so many things that I, in terms of skills and abilities and people that I met, things that developed over that beautiful long time period that served me to this day. They make you so successful. It's that experience. So I love, um, there's a saying of overnight businesses took 10 years to create. <laughs> you yes. know, some, there's been someone building behind the scenes there. You mentioned earlier B-School. Yes. That's your incredible business school, digital business school. Yes. I read a couple tenants that you have. You don't call them tenants, but you have a few key learnings there. What are some of those? 
So B School is an online business school for modern entrepreneurs who want to both make money and make a difference. And what I really do in B School, like people come into this program usually because they either want to start or grow something. Maybe they've been trying on their side on their own for a little while, and they're like, "God, I'm too overwhelmed. I don't know what the heck to focus on. Right. I need a plan and guidance and a system to follow through." That's when we usually get folks like that. And one of the things we focus on is profit clarity. Like that's what we focus on first in the program. Profit clarity is all around understanding where the real profit is in your business. And that has many layers. So one of them is ideal customer. You know, a big mistake that many business owners make, I certainly made when I was first starting out, was trying to be a coach to everyone. Right. And if you're talking to everybody, you're talking to nobody. Mm -hmm. Your marketing will be extremely ineffective. You'll feel like you're doing all of the things, but you're not seeing results. And that's usually one of the reasons why. And people are really hesitant. They're like, oh no, she's going to tell me to niche down and get specific. And I'm going to leave out all of these people that I really want to serve. And that is another myth. It never happens. When you understand how to identify the people that you are meant to serve, it doesn't limit your market. It actually expands it. And I know this sounds paradoxical, but we take people through an exercise that helps them do it. Another piece of profit clarity is really looking at your business and understanding where the most profit is, not just financially, Jim, emotionally and spiritually. Mm. Oftentimes, people have Uh, revenue sources, services, things that are kind of on their menu of offerings. And they're not really paying attention to both the numbers in terms of the expenses and the profit, Mm -hmm. but also what does it feel like to you to offer that service? Is that where all of your joy is going? Or when someone says yes to that package, are you like, uh, no, never. <laughs> I and don't want to deliver that. That's it doesn't right. feel good. Yeah. And so we've had so many transformational stories of people really taking a clear-eyed look at their profit clarity and being able to move around puzzle pieces so that they are focusing on the products or the services that have the highest profit margin, but also the highest joy margin. Mm -hmm. So they're doing more of what makes them excited, which means they're delivering on a higher level, which means they have better testimonials. It's this virtuous circle of business goodness, but it takes some strategic looking and decision making, and that's what we talk about. We have so many different modules, and I think one of the most powerful pieces of the program in terms of content is for anyone that feels resistant or scared or even confused about marketing or that feeling like, I'm the creative person, someone else should do that for me. They come out the other side a lover of modern marketing. Like, so proud of what they do. They get excited about campaigns. They get excited about the money that's coming in. And they get excited about how that money makes a difference, not just for their family, but for their team and for the causes that they want to put those dollars behind in the world. Right, because you can you can do whatever whatever you want to do with the money that you create. That's right. You can help the world. You can help yourself. Yeah. So one of the things that we talk about is health coaching is the fastest growing career segment in in the wellness industry, and the wellness industry is growing massively too. Soon, health coaching will be mainstream with insurance paying for it, um, which is really exciting. So there'll be a lot more health coaches. Yep. So how do you feel about specializing in your business? Just like you have to know who you're catering to, who your market is. Um, how about specializing, getting a specialty course in gut health? or or Is that important, do you think? Well, I think it has to align. What We talk about this um, in B-School a lot. It's the sweet spot, right? It's the thing that you are extremely passionate about, something that really lights you up. Sometimes it's because you yourself have gone through a particular issue or a particular challenge. And you're like, oh my goodness, I so many other people need to know about this. I, I was in so much pain. It took me so much time. I want to shorten the learning curve. So there's what brings you to life. And then there's what the market actually needs and wants and what they're willing to pay for. So we walk people through a set of exercises about how to really find what we call their blue ocean. There was a great business book called Blue Ocean Strategy. Mm -hmm. And so it's wonderfully creative in how to differentiate yourself, not from your head, but from your heart and your creativity. So to your point, I think that it is important to find areas of the health coaching world where you feel that you can dig in and really own it. You know, like in B-School, we're not coaching people that want to necessarily go and get VC capital, although some people in our program eventually went to do that, but I didn't teach them how to do that because that's not what we're teaching. Right. You know, so we've had 55,000 students go through the program from over 600 industries. So we're certainly not limited, 
but we are focused mm -hmm. in terms of what we're teaching people. And I think the same kind of mentality can apply to health coaches. You, I don't think it's going to be good for folks to say, I can do everything. I'm the, it's just not practical. I don't think it's exciting. I think that giving yourself um, some frameworks to work through so you can find where those sweet spots are yeah. in terms of the specific content, what lights you up, what's going on in the marketplace, that's where the real magic happens. Mm -hmm. So what do you think someone at the end of the B school, they grad, they finish the program, it's yeah. a four-week program, correct? Oh, it's, it's actually eight weeks, and here's right. the best part. Um, if you become a B-schooler, you're a B-schooler for life. So you never have to pay again. We update the program every year. Even better. Oh, that's amazing. It's amazing. Yeah. So you have access to mentor coaches. You have access to the community. It's like a one and done thing. So we've had people that have come through the program in like 2010 right. that still go through it. And people are like, well, why don't people go through it? And, well, if you want to be a master at anything, you master the fundamentals. And you go back and you look at the key movers in your business that as you and the marketplace evolve, these are the practices you come back to to reshape yourself so you can take it to an even higher level. Right. Like yeah. anything else, you can learn to be a master in business. Yes, absolutely. But I, I think I might have interrupted your question. You said, so when people are done with the program. So when people are done with the program, what what is what will they have gained? What, what will the next step be available to them? Yeah. So I think in terms of outcomes, um, it can vary widely because people come in at all different stages, right? Some people are coming in at the very beginning of their journey and I, I don't even have my first client yet. Right. And some people have already built some of them million dollar plus businesses and they know that one or two tweaks can add many zeros to their bottom line. Mm -hmm. But I think what people really walk away with the most is this sense of confidence in how to grow their business as big and fast as they want. And it's all aligned with their values. So they have a strategic plan to get more customers. If they want to do things that are scaled in terms of selling online programs or um, you know, uh, teaching programs or doing things in person, like they have their own plan, not someone else's, mapped out from themselves. They have community, they have support, and they have a place to come again and again to keep refining their skills. Mm -hmm. A plan is important. The confidence to execute it is even more important. And the support when you find yourself, which we all do from time to time, in that place where you're like, um, okay, I'm in a new zone. Right. This is a new level of growth for me. I need a little bit of guidance. I need some help. I need to bounce some ideas off of people. I think one of the biggest detriments that can happen to any business owner is loneliness. I mean, we know this from the health standpoint. Loneliness is on the rise, and it is detrimental to our health. And I think in terms of entrepreneurship, it's deadly there too. Mm -hmm. If you don't have people that understand what it's like to be a coach, to build something online in this digital world, if most people around you um, work in a more corporate environment and they don't have those entrepreneurial instincts or how do you talk about emails and opt-ins and conversions and you know what I mean, your social audience growing, you have that community, which I found can be invaluable. Community is important. Yeah. In any profession, any job. It makes you feel whole, right? It gives you a sense of purpose when you can interact with your community. I think it's essential. And I mean, I've done a lot of um, studying in terms of health and longevity too. And it is one of the most critical factors if you want to lead not only a long life, but a healthy life. Your social connections, that social fabric that you develop, it's everything. And I'll tell you this, my best friend in the whole world, I met online. Really? Yeah. And some of my most treasured, first of all, teammates, employees, colleagues, I didn't necessarily meet them in real life. I met them online. And that's one of the most incredible, powerful pieces. Again, I'll speak for B-School, but if you put yourself in any great learning environment, that's one of the benefits that can come out. I love that. We talk a lot about getting the education that you need to be successful. Business training is part of health coaching. Yes. Uh, this sounds like an amazing opportunity Guys, what I suggest is that you take action now. It's time for you to make an impact in the world. We talk about the ripple effect that can change the health and happiness of the world. Your business is part of that ripple effect. Get the education that you need. Thank you, Marie. It was great to have you. Thank you so much.